Order in the court. Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. The Honorable Chief Justice Charles T. Kennedy presiding. Good morning and welcome to this session of the Florida Supreme Court. The first case on our docket today is One West Bank versus Palmero. Uh, the counsel for petitioner is now recognized. Good morning. If it please the court, Bill McCann of the law office of William McCann, along with Jonathan Morton of Kale Gates and Joshua Fedcraft of Burr Foreman, we represent the petitioner. The issue before the court this morning is who is the borrower in this transaction? The note, the loan agreement, the loan application, the applicable loan documents, all are signed by Mr. Palmero and all define Mr. Palmero as the sole borrower. Mrs. Palmero executed a document called the non-spouse borrower authorization where she acknowledged that she was not a borrower. And she did execute the mortgage on a line that states that she is a borrower. After a full trial, the trial court determined that Mrs. Palmero was not a borrower. The sole borrower was Mr. Palmero. On appeal to the third DCA, the initial panel in a decision authored by Judge Robert Locke determined and affirmed that, that ruling by the trial court that Counsel, Mr. Palmero- I'm sorry. I I'm sorry, I just want to go straight to the, uh, the note. Um, the note contains the following language. Um, if, quote, a borrower dies and the property is not the principal residence of at least one surviving borrower, unquote. If um, your argument is right and all the transaction documents reflect a deal in which the borrower were singular, how do you deal with that language in the note that acknowledges that uh, the, the likelihood or the possibility that there would be more than one surviving borrower? I, I believe what the note is defining is the, the rules that apply to a reverse mortgage. It doesn't become due until there is no longer a borrower, surviving borrower residing in the home. I don't think there's any question the note defines Mr. Palmero as a borrower and is executed solely by Mr. Palmero. So that triggering or acceleration clause that you referred to, Your Honor, is the same one in the mortgage. And, and that is why we're here and that is the issue. If, if the court were to determine that Mr. Palmero is the sole borrower, then the trial court and the initial power court are correct and petitioners entitled to a final judgment of foreclosure. You, you concede though, for the purposes of the um, background federal law that allowed this mortgage to be insured. Um, first of all, I guess we should establish, it, you, you, you concede that Mrs. Palmero continues to reside at the property, is that right? To my knowledge, correct. And certainly as of the time of the trial. Yes. Do you also concede that she that that the, the transaction wouldn't have happened? That is, the mortgage would not have been insurable um, had she not executed and participated in uh, the reverse mortgage documentation. That is not correct. Um, I, I, she did not need to participate under federal law. Um, there were single spouse borrower insured loans for. I'll say approximately seven years, if not more. Uh, that is why she signed. That's the very reason she signed the document designated as a non-borrower certification. It was not and it, it required under federal law at the time this loan was originated that both spouses be borrowers. That regulation came in, I believe, 2014, some seven or eight years later. In addition, the federal rules and federal statutes pertaining to the insurance alone are between HUD, FHA, and the lender, not between the borrower and the lender. And there are several cases we cited that says, including one out of the 11th Circuit Federal Court, that says these 
federal statutes simply do not apply to the relationship between a borrower and lender, only between HUD and the lender. If that's true, then why did she sign the mortgage? She signed the mortgage for two reasons, Your Honor. The first being she is a spouse. Under Florida law, a spouse must subordinate his or her interest in the property to the mortgage lien under Florida's constitution. And that is why the spouse executes mortgage initially. In this case, she also had a remainder interest. And so she signed for two reasons. I point out to the court that the children also signed the mortgage because of their remainder interest. And no one has ever argued that the children are borrowers in this transaction. What can you explain how federal law applies in this circumstance? It does not apply at all would be our position. The federal law is regarding the insurance of the loan between the lender and the government. And by the way, there are non insured reverse mortgages in existence. It's the only reverse mortgages are not sure. So it does not apply. I, as I said, I point to the court of the state. What was this loan not insured? To my knowledge, it was an insured loan. What doesn't federal law apply certain conditions to the provision of the insurance for the mortgage? Absolutely. But that only applies to whether or not the lender is entitled to that insurance. It doesn't apply to the contract between the borrower and the lender. And I also, as I pointed out, the federal government was not enforcing that provision for eight, 10 years. There were single spouse borrowers on insured loans for a long period of time before the government finally passed a regulation. Well, after this loan was originated. What would happen if these same facts occurred today? In other words, I'm trying to understand if there's a real need to continue to try to address the facts of this case under the current state of the law. Well, I think there certainly is for several reasons. First of all, there are many loans like this loan that were originated during the time period I'm speaking of. But more importantly, the concepts that the third district refused to apply the mutual construction doctrine and that you must read the note and mortgage together. This doesn't exist solely in the reverse mortgage world. It applies to all notes and mortgage. I will point to the court that there, the concept of a non-recourse loan did not originate with reverse mortgages. It's been in existence for decades. And in fact, we cite two cases in our brief that were non-recourse transactions, just like this transaction where the courts applied the mutual construction doctrine and the doctrine that the note mortgage must be read together. That's Paula Castro versus Rudd and McVeigh versus Mirabito. So the importance of this case is not limited to reverse mortgages. The ruling by the third district was we're not going to look to the note because the mortgage is recorded. We're not going to look to the note because the mortgage is the document that the lender is proceeding under. There's no case anywhere that says we're going to apply the mutual construction doctrine to a recorded instrument only, or we're going to apply the mutual construction doctrine to the doc, to the document that just happens to have the remedy in it. Let me, let me go back to my question earlier under if, if application of the federal law as it stands today, would your client be able to foreclose now with the current state of the federal law? It would not be a federally insured reverse mortgage is the way I would answer that. Yeah, they could deny insurance and proceed with foreclosure. There is nothing about the federal statute or the federal regulation that governs the relationship between the borrower and the lender. 
But you are correct, Your Honor, that that the insurance would not be available. Is it today? Counsel, is it the is it in these reverse uh, amortization mortgages? Uh, is it a common practice to to have the husband and the wife sign as borrowers in the mortgage? And then the note says something else that exclude one of them as the borrower. What, why do you do that? What, was well, this no, a mistake? It, it, if you look at, for example, the Levine case, that is where a reverse mortgage, I, I'll say, properly was executed because it designated that in that case, Mrs. Levine was executing it as a non borrowing spouse. Um, so it says the, the, the mortgage, I'm looking right here, the last page, it says Robert Palmero, borrower, Luisa Palmero, borrower. Why do you do that? You, did you have to do that to effectuate this transaction? Absolutely not. It, well, why did you do it? it or why did it, they do it? She had to execute it because she. I was the spouse and had a remainder interest. The mistake was the line it was signed on, on a pre-printed form that said borrower. But if you looked at all the transaction documents, the note particularly, there's no question the sole borrower as found by the trial court, as found by the initial panel, was Mr. Palmero. So if you took that, uh, position of the third district to its full extreme. If a witness to a mortgage happened to sign on that line marked borrower by mistake with their name there and they signed it, according to the en banc opinion of the third district, that witness is a borrower as a matter of law. And that simply is not correct. Counsel, can I ask you, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, just in terms of the broader implications that you talked about with the mutual construction doctrine, I think in this case, the mortgage itself has an ambiguity in it because it defines only the husband is the borrower and then there's the signature at the end. So in that sense, it makes it an easy case for looking at all the other documents. But what if, what if the, uh, and I know that this isn't this case, but I'm just curious about, because you said that there, you know, that there was this broader kind of legal principle in play. If the mortgage itself were unambiguous that it defined both people as the borrower, let's say the signature block is the same way it is now, but in the beginning where it was defining the term borrower, it had both people. And then all the other documents were inconsistent with that. What, what Does that just create kind of a fact issue or do, would we say that the mortgage itself Kind of stands alone, and that we would just look at that. How, how does that? How does the mutual construction thing play in? If if those had been the facts. Well, I first of all agree with your position that the mortgage is ambiguous and, and is there. I would secondly say ambiguity is not required for application of the mutual construction doctrine. No, in all the cases we cited in the brief, there was no ambiguity. But to answer your specific question is I would hope that the court would look to all the documents because to look at one document it, it, it creates a, a, a bad result. Uh, if you look at all the documents in order to uh, determine the intent of the parties, well, especially and, and in counsel, this case. Counsel, becomes, isn't the, counsel, isn't it the case that the, the mortgage refers to the other documents? And, and, and it it's kind of contingent upon the operation of the other documents, the note. And, and that, is, that, is, that is correct as well. The same acceleration clause that we're working under here, that the third district said the precondition hadn't been met is in the note and is in the mortgage. Yet in the note, it's unquestionable that uh, the borrower is Mr. Palmero. In the mortgage, at least according to the third district, there becomes this issue because Mrs. Palmero signed on the line designated as borrower, notwithstanding that she didn't sign the note loan agreement and signed a document called the non-borrower spousal certification. Well, so counsel, I, is, counsel, is it possible to enforce the mortgage without the note? 
No, the, the mortgage is solely a security for the underlying obligation created in the note and in the uh, loan ob in loan agreement. And, and that's the premise of the century old rule that the note and mortgage must be read together. They're one contract. They're not two separate contracts. The court has held this is one agreement. They must be read together. And, and there are numerous cases where the note said one thing, the mortgage said another, and the court said the, the note controls for obvious reasons. Uh, without a note, a mortgage is, is kind of like an empty vault. It serves no purpose. So I, okay, I counsel, believe- you are, Counsel, you are now uh, uh, about to go into your rebuttal time. I just, that this, you've got 30 more seconds before you get there. I, I, if there's a question at this time of the court, I will try to answer it. If not, I'll reserve the rebuttal time. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel? Good morning. May it please the court. Jeffrey Hearn from Legal Services Greater Miami on behalf of the petitioner, Luisa Romero. Reverse mortgages are different, unique, financial instruments designed to keep elderly homeowners in their homes. By their own terms, reverse mortgage notes state that the lender may only enforce its terms um, by enforcing the security agreement against the property. So it takes the normal relationship between a mortgage and a note and turns it upside down. The mortgage is the instrument that controls. And that fact alone makes reverse mortgages distinguishable from this court's prior precedent about the note controlling over the mortgage. Um, the other issue in this case- But, is but counsel, I mean, isn't it still the case, even in this context, you, that the, the mortgage can't be enforced without the note? The nerd, correct, the note has meaning. It, it sets yeah. the balance, the balance of the loan and who can enforce it, the holder of it, can, can uh, proceed with the foreclosure. Um, but, but that's it. When we're looking at the acceleration clause, um, which is paragraph nine of the mortgage. Uh, you notice it doesn't even reference the note in that, in that paragraph, um, and it references the borrower. The borrower is a defined term in both the note and the mortgage. Um, and the Crickle case says that we give, a, we give effect to both instruments um, when we can. So if you look at the note, it says that the borrower is who signs at the bottom. That is Mr. Palmero. Um, as I said before, the note by its own own uh, terms says that it can only be enforced through the mortgage. And we go to the mortgage. At the top of the mortgage, it, in, it has a definition of borrower. The lender chose to include all mortgagors as borrower. Um, it's not just Mr. Palmero, otherwise it would say Mr. Palmero borrower and then include the rest of the mortgagors. But so it didn't do so that. counsel, if, if um, let's just playing a thought experiment, if the signature block said instead of mortgage, instead of borrower under her name, said remainderman or spouse. Are we still here? Um, she's in the definition of borrower, and I, I believe so. Um, of course, that's a different fact pattern, a little bit, a little bit closer to ambiguity. But the definition of borrower is clear. Um, she is a mortgagor, and she signed signed the mortgage. Um, and they and the lender chose to define all mortgagors as borrowers. And I, it's comparable to the Sonderquist case from the second district court of appeal and the Greer case from the fourth district. In both of those cases, the courts um, were enforcing acceleration clause. And in those mortgages, the mortgage itself said, um, the mortgage is going to control over the note. Well, that's just sort of the inverse of what we have here. The note is saying, the mortgage is going to control. That's how the lender is going to enforce its rights. Um, and to recognize that there, there can be distinctions, even the loan agreement recognizes that. On, on page 406 of the record, uh, paragraph 4.1 of the loan agreement recognizes that there can be acceleration under one or more of the security instruments. And what that means is that the, the line of credit that's available uh, to the homeowners is cut off upon Mr. Palmero's death but the lender cannot foreclose, cannot enforce its rights under the, the note until Ms. all borrowers are, are deceased or no longer living in the property. Um, borrower is, is unambiguous, it's a defined term. If we look at this, uh, the precedent, if you look at the traveler's case that's cited in the briefs, 
In that case, the court was, was trying to interpret the, the meaning of the word accident uh, in an insurance policy. And in both the majority opinion and uh, one of the dissents point at, points out that the term accident is undefined. Um, you look to the Denny, Denny case uh, from this court. In that case, pollution was the, the term. It was a defined term. And what the insured was trying to do in that case is exactly what the lender is doing here. They're trying to rewrite a defined term. Um, and Counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, it, it be the be at best case scenario for your position, this, this thing at the beginning is ambiguous as to whether it's referring to all of these people as borrower. And especially when you read it, I mean, you kind of, you're trying, it seems like you're trying to have it both ways because I mean, to me, the more natural reading of the beginning is that, the, is that there's one borrower, i.e. the husband. But even if you think that maybe all these people are considered borrowers, then you go into the signature block and these other folks who you, who you are calling borrowers didn't sign as borrower, which would create an ambiguity, which would then require you to look at all the other stuff. Putting aside, I understand that your colleague on the other side, their position is you just inherently have to look at all the documents together. But even if we wanted to try to look at this one thing in isolation, it seems like there's, there's, it, it's inescapable to conclude that there's, at, 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 you know, that there's an ambiguity here. The, the document isn't internally consistent. Well, I, I would, I would suggest that if, if that, if only Mr. Palmero was the borrower, the term would come immediately after his name. Um, paragraph nine does suggests. That, does that mean that your position is that the children are also borrowers? No, that issue has not been advanced by anyone in this case. No, but I'm asking you, I mean, it, it, I don't see how you can read this and say that it's not referring solely to Robert Palermo, but is referring to Luis Palermo too as a borrower, but not the other people that are listed in the clause clauses that follow Robert Palermo. I mean, the mortgage is given on this date, the mortgager is Robert Roberto Palermo, a married man, and then it goes on and lists the others in their relationship to the property and him. So how can you look at that text and say that your theory is that the husband and wife are borrowers, but the children are not? I just, I'm not following that at all. Well, that, that's in the definition. I, I do think the facts are different if you're looking at ambiguity for purposes of the children um, and Ms. Palmero. The lender pre-printed her name and wrote the name borrower underneath. And perhaps, you know, there, there was no testimony at trial about, about the intent. So all we have are the documents themselves, uh, which, which this court has said is, is the best evidence of a, a party's intent. Um, and the lender chose to include, uh, include her name as well as the term borrower. And perhaps um, that is because of the background. The children's names too in the same manner as her name, correct? Not, not on the mortgage itself. Um, on that in the, in the first paragraph, you said that borrow was a defined term in the first paragraph, correct? That's your argument. Yes. And that your position is that that first paragraph defines both Roberto and his wife as borrowers, but does not um, define the children as borrowers. Is that your position? No, my position is they are defined as a borrower. Um, there oh. may be more ambi ambiguity created by the, the last page of the document, but, but, but there's no ambiguity in that definition. All of those individuals are included in the definition of borrower. Okay, so, okay. So the, uh, the bargain that was struck here, according to you, is that the lender could not foreclose as long as any one of those people, any one of the four was remaining in the house. Potentially, but as I said, no, we have not advanced it's that. It is or it isn't. I mean, that. Well, that's what the definition of borrower is. The, the, the mortgage paragraph nine says that you can't foreclose until okay. all borrowers are no longer living in the property. Mr. Hearn, if, if Mrs. Palmero was a borrower, why did she fill out a quote, non-borrower spouse ownership interest certification? There was no testimony about that at trial. Um, the, the trial court initially ruled that it was inadmissible and then cut off testimony. Um, and, and for several reasons. One, you know, it's undated. It's unclear that it was signed uh, contemporaneously with the rest of the documents. It's not signed by the closing agent um, to indicate that. And I think even more importantly, it's not incorporated into the documents. Um, if you look at paragraph 26 of the mortgage, 
if this was the critical document, which, which would show the party's intent, uh, the lender could have incorporated it into paragraph 26 of the mortgage, um, but it chose not to do that. So you, you don't dispute that it's in the record, but you throw some shade on it. Exactly, it, it should not be given any way. And clearly, even under the mutual construction doctrine, um, it, it doesn't meet one of the documents that we would look at uh, to, to um, because it's, it's not um, of, of the same, I think the, the J.M. Montgomery case talks about contracts of the same dignity. Um, this clearly is not of the same dignity as a mortgage. Um, and, and looking to this document, and this is what the, the third district's on bank opinion said, is that we're not going to, to, to look to this questionable document to then redefine a party to a recorded instrument, a, a mortgage. Um, so I mentioned before, we go to mutual construction if there is no, no ambiguity. Um, and, and in fact, in this case, the trial court did not find that there was uh, an ambiguity in the mortgage. It sort of worked backwards. It started with the non-borrowing spouse certification and then moved to, to the mortgage itself. Um, you know, no court has uh, that, I'm sorry, the trial court did not find that there's ambiguity. If we look at the case law um, that's cited in the briefs, uh, like the J.M. Montgomery case, uh, which, which petitioner puts on, uh, is includes in its reply brief. In that case, it was a, what ventilation meant. Um, and it was a, a contractor subcontractor dispute with, with the city of Miami. So the court said it was okay to look at uh, another agreement entered into with another subcontractor. Essentially, there was a, a, a latent uh, ambiguity. And I think the, the Denny case explains that you can have, uh, you can, that you can look to, you can't create latent ambiguities um, that are going to change the express terms of the contract. And the example they give is the, the greenhouse on Pecan Street and the goods being delivered uh, to a greenhouse. And there's two houses. Um, that is not the situation we have here. We have the mortgage that says that the lender can only uh, foreclose if uh, the borrower is living in the property. We look, Ms. Palmero is living in the property, look to the definition of borrower, she's a borrower. Therefore, they can't foreclose the security instrument. Could you explain how federal law applies in this case? So we can see that, that Ms. Palmero cannot enforce the federal law um, the, the courts there are doing, you know, that what, what they did is they said that that, that statute says that HUD uh, shall insure mortgages. So that's a dispute between HUD and, and the lenders. But I think what, where federal law comes into play is that it shows that this interpretation is reasonable um, and that it's consistent. Uh, you know, it's not absurd. It's consistent with the, the intent of the federal policy that would, had been in place. Um, petitioner is correct that there were loans that were insured by HUD um, during this period where there were younger spouses taken off, but, but that was, uh, HUD has fixed that. Uh, the regulations were inconsistent with, with the statute and that has been corrected going forward since 2014. I, I think it's also important to note that this is a, a fact pattern that is very limited, um, that lenders did write mortgages differently. If you look at the cases that are on pages six uh, and going on to seven of the reply brief down into the footnote, these are all reverse mortgage cases where they found the surviving spouse was, was not a borrower. Those fall into two distinct pools that are, that, that are different. So a lot of them, the surviving spouse was not even included in the definition of borrower. Some of them weren't even on title. And then the other group of cases, you find that the lender did it you know, at least did something on the face of the mortgage to designate that the surviving spouse was not a borrower. And I think that that, that goes to some of the um, questions we've had about the economic realities behind the transaction. One of which is, is Judge Emus right in his dissent that Miss Palmero received a larger payout because she was not a borrower under the instrument? Is that as a matter of just factual record, do you, uh, do you dispute that or is that right? So the trial court did not allow in, uh, the, the lender attempted to, to put in some, some figures. Um, so there's no specifics in, in the record. Um, but generally speaking, yes, there, there would be a difference. Um, but I think it's important to note that there's nothing in the record that suggests that um, the, 
the Palmeros were desperate. They weren't trying to stop a foreclosure. Um, and in fact, there was equity. Um, if you look page uh, 458 through 460, you'll see that they took out draws on the line of credit of a few thousand dollars a couple of times. You know, my, my question doesn't go to their desperation or anything. It, it goes to what really is like, what's the economic benefit, like the why that Justice Polson was asking you about earlier, right? Or, or Justice LaBarga asked you, you know, like, why was it that th this ambiguity in the definition of borrower exists? Is it plausible to say that one reason why it exists is because it uh, stood, the, the Palmero stood to benefit from having uh, Miss Palmero have non-borrower status? It is plausible, and I think the amicus points out uh, additional issues around incentives for uh, for lenders and brokers as well. Um, but none of that is is in the record on either side. Um, so so we're just sort of going off pure speculation over what the the intent was. Um, you know, Sir Mr. Palmero uh, cared for his wife and wanted to ensure she was safe as well. But we don't we don't know what happened. Um, there was no testimony at trial. Uh, about that, uh, about the transaction. So counsel on the federal law point, you know, I'm not, I don't think that your argument just looking at the four corners of the mortgage is that great. But I mean, do you agree that once you look outside that document, whether you're looking at federal law or looking at these other related agreements, the note and everything else, I mean, isn't that pretty much fatal to your case once you start looking out beyond that? I don't, I don't, I don't think so, because, I mean, you, you clearly show that the, um, the, the initial loan application had, had uh, Ms. Palmero on it. Um, I mean, the, but, the, but the application, the revised application that led to this, to the actual transaction that occurred, I mean, there's no dispute that that was just by the husband, right? Correct. That, that was the second loan. And your client signed the, you know, non-borrower spouse thing and everything. It just seems like if you look outside this document, the evidence is overwhelming that there was only one borrower. Do you disagree with that? The borrower, and as our position is the borrower is under the note and the borrower for purposes of when can the lender foreclose and enforce the security instrument is a separate analysis. Um, I, I, I think it's important to note that um, the petitioner is is arguing that there's sort of a floodgates issue here, um, and I and I and that is not the case for for two of the reasons mentioned. As we said, this won't happen again. HUD has ensured that people like Ms. Palmero will not lose their home um, it, going forward um, to ensure that that surviving spouses are protected. Um, additionally, as those cases in the the reply brief on six and seven point uh, indicate lenders often wrote it differently. Uh, and when they did, um, it might create an ambiguity um, for which, uh, for which the, the courts then could go to these additional documents. Um, and the idea that, that parties can look, can come to the court later and say, look at these other documents um, to redefine a party to, to the transaction um, the only other document that, that Mrs. Palmero signed um, is this questionable certification. Um, and that, that cannot be relied upon to change the very party to the transaction. Um, that would lead to uncertainty and unnecessary litigation or if we allow parties to rewrite um, who is the party to the contract. And um, so, so I'd just like to, to conclude that we're asking this court either to uh, dismiss the, the case for, for lack of jurisdiction because there's no conflict or alternatively to affirm this court's, uh, the third district's decision uh, on bank opinion. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal. First of all, on the issue of ambiguity, with all due respect, three courts have visited this issue prior to it reaching this court. And two courts have ruled that she's not a borrower. One court has ruled she is. I suggest to the court that the term ambiguity is that it can be reasonably interpreted in more than one way. The borrower, or excuse me, the, the spouse, Mrs. Palmero, signed the non-borrower certification for a very clear reason. Under the program, and the testimony is in the trial, 
Ms. Palmeros received more funds by designating Mr. Palmero as a sole borrower. And that's on the record at 520 to 532. And again, on 556, uh, the Palmeros actually received about 24,000 more funds, more in additional funds by designating Mr. Palmero as a sole borrower. And that's why originally the application was by both of them. Four months later, after receiving counseling, and there is a certification of counseling in the, in the record, they determined that they would be able to receive more funds by designating Mr. Promero as the sole borrower. This program of reverse mortgage is very important to the elderly. This funds in this mortgage paid off two existing traditional loans that existed on the property. The elderly typically don't have the income to pay monthly payments. So the program allows them to take their assets, in this case, their home, and they eliminate or relieve them of the obligation to pay those monthly payments on the two existing mortgages that were paid off. And this was intentional by the Palmeros. Um, it's a benefit. They got the benefit of the bargain. They negotiated it. And now they want to change the benefit of the bargain to extend uh, this loan. And the question was asked about the children being a borrower. Well, the children could not be a borrower under this program because of their ages. You don't qualify until you're at least 62. It seems, so, it seems like, Council, it seems like you're trying to apply the definition in the note, a document that she did not sign. Um, instead of the document, uh, instead of the definition in the mortgage, a document she did sign. Why should that be? Well, we're here to determine that very issue, who the borrower is. The fact that she did not sign the note is proof that she was not a borrower. A and so it's but, a but little the bit- right to foreclose as described in the mortgage, the document that she signed and is obligated under, not the note, a document she did not sign. She's not obligated under this program in any way, shape, or form. She signed the mortgage as she's required to do under Florida law. And this would be the case if it were a reverse mortgage or a conventional mortgage or otherwise. Could the, could the program have gone through or could the loan have gone through had she not signed? The mortgage program theory. Theoretically, the program could have gone through. Realistically, the mortgage would have been enforceable against the property. And since the lender had agreed, that was its sole remedy. And understand, the lender's taking the risk here that depending on how long the party survives and what the appraised value of the property is at the time, they're taking the full risk and providing these funds to an elderly couple so that they're relieved of the monthly payment on the existing mortgages. So when you say could it have gone through, there would not have been an enforceable lien under Florida's constitution, but for her signature and, and also because she held a remainder interest as the children did. So they needed to subordinate their interest in the property to the loan. They are not a borrower. There's no, Council, no concept you, that there being a more Council, you are now in overtime, so if you could sum up in about uh, 30 seconds. We are requesting that the court quash the decision of the third DCA and enter a determination that the petitioner is entitled to a final judgment of foreclosure. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you uh, both.